Anyway, um, I'll tell you, it's interesting being a dad now and thinking about my dad growing up and sort of the things that he tried to pass on to me at a young age and then now thinking, oh, my dad was kind of right. Have you ever experienced that where you kind of realize as a teenager, your dad is the uncoolest, wrongest person in the world and then you get to college or you get out of the house um, and then he's now the smartest person you've ever met uh, because he makes sense. And now you're an adult and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm becoming my dad. Um, my dad used to say, um, and I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Jimmy Fallon's dad quotes. He, uh, Jimmy Fallon's a talk show host. He does this like dad quotes thing every year, dad vice or whatever. And it's some funny, funny stuff. I'm not going to read any of them today, so you can look it on YouTube. But, um, but my dad would say, you know, um, uh, look, you know, wh when you like a girl, look at the girl's mom, because that's what she's going to look like when she's that age. <laughs> I don't know how true that is or not, but it's just something that dad says, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's a Puerto Rican thing. I, I don't know. And uh, he'd say, you, you marry the girl, you marry the family. Just know that, you know. And I'm like, okay, uh, sure. I'm just trying to go on a date over here. It's not a, <laughs> I'm not trying to talk about marriage. Every date ended in a conversation about marriage with my dad. It was interesting. Um, he'd say this, you pay now or you pay later, but you're always going to pay. <laughs> and now as an adult, as I'm trying to fix things or trying to figure out you know, how to fix things, I'm like, you know, you're right. You pay now, you can pay the money to have a professional fix it, or you can do it your, yourself, and it totally breaks. You know what I'm saying? You pay now, or you pay, but you're always going to end up paying something. And um, it, it's interesting how this happens, how dad just sort of drops these one-liners on you sometimes, and you don't really understand it till later in life. Um, and, and I think at some level, in a similar way with God, we're like that. God has this incredible wisdom. He's got this incredible, uh, some incredible one-liners in his own scriptures. And it's not until we go through something in life that it actually clicks with us like, oh, snap, God was right about that. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and I think we, uh, we can have this battle sometimes. And it's interesting, you know, we're going to be doing this sermon series here called Wisdom. Uh, we're going to be studying the book of 1 Corinthians and kind of going through the book of 1 Corinthians here for the next six weeks, kind of taking different uh, elements of it and uh, kind of using this, but, but a lot of it is about uh, wisdom uh, and how the difference is between wisdom from the world um, and wisdom from God. And so we're going to be looking at this, and you know, it's easy to get influenced by wisdom from the world or from friends or successful people, and you go on Pinterest and you get this inspiring quote, and you're like, oh yes, I'm going to base my life on that. And then, you know, you, you hear uh, people, you, you, you'd be amazed to find out how many people believe the quote, God helps those who help themselves. You know, in the Bible it says God helps those who help themselves. There are so many in our society that believe that to be true, and it's nowhere in the Bible. But yet we base our lives on these kind of comments or these kind of quotes. And so um, uh, what we're going to talk about is really what God's wisdom is all about. We're going to be reading the book of 1 Corinthians. Jesus, Jesus dies. He raises from the dead. He commissions his followers to, to make disciples of all nations. And, and the church, the, the ecclesia, the assembly, the gathering was established in Jerusalem. And after some years, this, a zealous Pharisee, a teacher of the law, becomes a follower of Jesus and begins missionary work to establish uh, small assemblies and churches around throughout the Mediterranean world. We know him as the Apostle Paul. And one of these journeys recorded in the book of Acts in chapter 18, he comes to the city of Corinth. And Corinth was a center of trade with two seaports. It, it was rapidly growing wealthy because of its location and easy access for commerce and business. Jews came for trade. Romans were there on official business. Greeks gravitated toward the city from the countryside. And commerce brought the mix of sailors and salesmen and bankers and people from every corner of the known Mediterranean world kind of assembled and lived and traveled through the city of Corinth. Morally, Corinthians were regarded as inferior, even according to the loose standards of the pagan world of that time. They were usually represented on stage, on the Roman stage, as drunk, drunkards. 
uh, one of the quotes, one of the slogans that was used in that time was to live as do the Corinthians, which was a slogan used to describe the vilest kind of life. The temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of fertility, was in the center of Corinth, and at one time it housed 1,000 temple prostitutes. And part of the religion was you go there, and and part of the religious uh, philosophy and perspective was go to the temple of Aphrodite and and sleep with these these, uh, prostitutes, and you'll be united with Aphrodite. I mean, this is, that was Corinth. The ebb and flow of travel and commerce brought the city, brought to the city all types of people, wealth and poverty, beauty and wretchedness, culture and squalor, all kinds of philosophies and religious perspectives were right there in Corinth. Does this remind you of any city that we may live in at any point in life? I mean, when I read this and I'm studying the, what historians describe about Corinth, I can't, I can't I can't help but think of the city that I currently live in, Long Beach, as a mirror image of that city and culture, with a seaport, an airport, all nations and demographics, different standards of morality, the rich and poor living literally next, next, you know, block to each other and these kind of things. I mean, this is where we live. It's a modern-day Corinth. And so I want to, I think it's a great opportunity for us to go through this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And, and part of Bible study, just so we understand, is it's not, it's being able to enter into what was happening there at that time and understand what the writer was telling those people in that time, at that, at, in that city, and then how do, how do, we, how do we take how, what applies to us today? Does that make sense? Not everything will apply, but the principles, the overlying principles will apply to us today. And I think Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul, has some very powerful things to teach us through this letter of the first Corinthians. Paul gets a report and uses this letter to address many of the issues that were happening in the church in Corinth. And we're going to use this as our text for the next few weeks. And I think it's going to help us to see some of the issues in the early church, how Paul addresses them, and it helps them to, to come to a more spiritually mature perspective on certain issues. And I think we'll find ourselves thinking and recognizing, huh, I wonder if this applies to us in our context, in this church at this time. A lot of the things that he says here are more for already professed you know, um, followers of Jesus, disciples, members of the congregation, uh, but if you're outside of the faith or, or kind of discovering faith, there's some interesting things here that you'll uh, hopefully will, will pierce your heart and, and grab your attention. Paul sums up the mentality of the Corinthian believers in this statement. He says it twice. Oh, the title of today's lesson is Gospel Wisdom. He says in, this, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12 and, and 10, 20, he says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. This is basically the mentality of the Corinthian living in that city and the Corinthian in the church. I have the right to do anything. I can do what I want. This is sort of the the mentality. Doesn't that not sound like an American to you? I have the right to do anything I want. Your 18-year-old comes to you and says that to you. I'm 18 now. I can do what I want. Your 25-year-old who maybe still lives in your home. Is telling you, I can do what I want. Paying no rent to you. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to get you riled up here. I'm not, I'm not going to try to do that here. I can do what I want. No one controls me or tells me what to do. And as we rely on this kind of thinking or have relied on it over and over again, even as believers, we end up finding ourselves sometimes in a mess. A mess in our families. A mess in our employment a mess in relationships, a mess in marriages, a mess in in our interaction with our children or with our parents because we have this mentality. I have the right to do anything, you say. But Paul says, "But, but not everything is beneficial. And so Paul begins with one of the issues that they're having in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, 
Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so Paul is starting to address one issue. There have been different preachers that have come through the city of Corinth, through the church in Corinth, and now some people love Apollos' preaching. Some people love Paul's preaching because he was the one that started the whole thing. Some people love Cephas, you know, Peter, who came through on a week, weekend visit, and they're like, oh, now I'm going to follow this guy. And so now there's factions in the church based on personality and leadership in the church. I love how this is a little interesting insight here. My brothers and sisters, it says some from Chloe's household. This letter was read in front of the whole church. Can you imagine if some from Chloe's household were sitting there in the audience? Hey, he just threw me under the bus. I mean, the transparency, the level of transparency within the church was to the point where you could get up and, and say, hey, somebody in this person's household was telling me. And yet he was able to deal with this is family. Because church, this is what church is. It's family. We try to get all private and all into No, church is family. And so he's about to address some family issues. God gives through Paul his intent for the church and just a, a perspective that is way different from the world. And so, and so he, he, he uses this platform of division to talk about something really big. And we're going to get into that here. Let's turn our Bibles. I'm not going to have the verses on the slides today. We're going to turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Please check out your phones, check out your Bibles whatever, your tablets, whatever you use. If you don't have one with you, please try to get close to somebody who does, and you can read along with us as we uh, read through these verses. Number one, he addresses this issue here, gospel wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. You guys with me here? You ready? All right. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The, the issue in the church, there was an issue in the church that they were having because, there, because of the city's influence and the amount of perspectives and religious philosophies. There is a great level of, of assumption and being able to, uh, I'm going to follow this teaching. Or I'm going to follow this teacher or this speaker or this preacher. And I found this quote on, in, on Pinterest and it's awesome and I'm going to follow that. And I'm, a lot of different, and I have attained a level of wisdom and, and knowledge that that, that allows me to live the way I do, and Paul, what Paul was saying, I know a lot more than Paul, and so, and there was this battle, this tension, uh, when you have all this information to, to pretend and to live and to, and to make decisions, because in your wisdom, it's better than what was originally established within the church. You guys follow me here? And so he addresses the issue. He says, listen, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Look at this. Follow this closely here. He uses these words interchange. It's amazing. This is an amazing writer right here, Paul. Look what he says in verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You see, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The disunity that is happening in the church because of their quote-unquote wisdom is only happening because of a misunderstanding of what true wisdom and God's plan is. To an unbeliever, those who are perishing, the cross is foolishness. 
Why would a deity, God, send his son and then allow him and kill him? And why would he do that? That makes no sense. That's foolishness. But that's Paul's point. God's wisdom frustrates man's wisdom and thoughts. And so he uses a verse in Isaiah, in the prophet Isaiah, to make this point because the Israelites had done this in the past, relying on their own wisdom and their own plan to defeat enemies around them. But if you read the Old Testament, you find time and time and time again that God always does something or uses someone that would be outside of our, of man's wisdom to do or to use. You look at Moses, you look at Abraham, at Jacob, at Joseph, at David, at Gideon, all of them would probably be people that you and I would be like, no, don't use that guy. He's weak, he's whack, he has no conviction, he's a deceiver, he's the youngest, he's the least, he's the, you see what I'm saying? In our wisdom, we'd be like, no, give me LeBron, give me Steph Curry, give me Kevin Durant, give, give me those guys. But you see, God chooses what we think would be foolish. He does that to frustrate our wisdom. And so this leads to Paul asking, where's the wise person? Because through the wisdom of the world, people didn't know him, but through the foolishness, quote unquote foolishness of what you think is foolish, of what was preached, they could know him. See, God had demonstrated the folly of human wisdom in Christ in that human wisdom would never lead anyone to think that God would allow his son to be crucified to save man. And so by acting, follow me here, by acting in a way that human wisdom would label foolish, God frustrated human wisdom. You follow me on that a little bit? Just go like this. Paul's making his point. See, God's wisdom is foolishness to us who don't believe, but his quote-unquote foolishness is wiser than our wisdom, especially to those who have made the decision to believe and follow Jesus. See, because no human can save themselves from sin or has the power to deliver and rescue from eternal sin. Only the weakness, quote-unquote weakness of God the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Christ can do that. And so Paul is using these words, wisdom, foolishness, strength, weakness, to help the Corinthian church understand that there is no merit, no power in their self-proclaimed wisdom, but only in the message of Jesus Christ, in the cross of Christ. Because, because, because of the gospel wisdom then, you need, he says, you need to remember then that you are, number two, a gospel people. A gospel people. Don't get distracted by the picture. I'll explain it in a minute. Look in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame, to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holy and redemption therefore as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the Lord so as Paul establishes the wisdom of God shown through the gospel through the good news of Jesus he now transitions into reminding the people of who they were before they knew of God's wisdom of the gospel the church in Corinth is a broad mix of people, mostly working class, some easily influenced by the world. At times, somewhat of a mob mentality existed in the church, and they would gravitate towards men who appealed to them and who, who, who were eloquent in their public speech. And Paul reminds them, hey, listen, not many of you were, influ were wise by human standards, so why are you using that argument with me right now? 
Why are you telling me that I have attained this, this level of knowledge and wisdom when, when not many of you were really influential or wise but according to human standards before you knew the gospel? But this is, and he's reminding them, this is exactly what God wants and who God uses to, sh- to shame who you deem to be wise in the world. To, to, again, to frustrate them. That's why I write this picture. Of all the people in the Lord of the Rings, who did they choose to save the world? The Hobbit. The Hobbit, the smallest, the least athletic. To shame what human wisdom would term as, the, why would you pick this guy? I wouldn't pick Frodo. I'd pick Legolas. <laughs> do, do you know what I'm saying? And in a similar way, God is, God is telling, Paul's kind of punking the, 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 the church in a, in a good way. As a, as a father kind of disciplines their child, he's like, listen, you, you're a hobbit. You are a spiritual hobbit. Remember who you were before you received the gospel. Not many of you are wise, according to human standards. But you see, God chose you and God called you in order to shame the world's wisdom. This is the legacy of the early church. Historians and writers during this time were amazed in the, in the first century church, were, in the first century, second century, the historians and writers were amazed by Christians. Because Christians, the church, took care of the poor and the marginalized, even among the unbelieving of society, the outcasts of society that didn't even believe in their faith, Christians would still take care of them. Christians would stand in the arena awaiting to be mauled by wild animals without worry because their hope was in the gospel. Christians endured persecution and even and, and, and unemployment and mistreatment because of their faith and beliefs. People in the world outside of the faith saw this and scoffed and mocked, but in the end would stand amazed at these people's approach to life in spite of incredible odds and challenges. God using the weak of the world to shame the strong, to nullify the things that are so that no one would boast, so that no one would be like, look at me, I'm the one doing this because God helps those who help themselves. Nuh-uh. God said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm using you because on your own you can't do anything. In fact, I'm going to use you so in such a great way that those Outside of the faith, those around the world will look at you and be like, and, and be ashamed, and try to figure this out. The Pharisees in the in the in the, uh, the Pharisees in Jerusalem, when they saw the boldness of John and Peter and James and some of these apostles, they said they it says that they stood astonished, because these men were unschooled and ordinary people. And this is the power of the gospel. He, he, it, it changes, it calls us, those who are unworthy, outside of human influence, and, and God uses us to his glory, to his impact, so that no one would boast. He kind of calls them back. He says, guys, Corinthians, remember, it's because of him that you're in Christ. There's nothing you've done. It's all about God. It's all about his gospel. So boast in the Lord and be his gospel people. Chapter 2, verse 4, this is Paul's kind of Paul's application of, of this, of being a gospel person. Look, look at just this, this quick verse. I don't have it on the slide. You got you to look with me here. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on what? God's power. So your faith, Paul's, Paul's whole point here, I want your, who cares about Apollos? I love the bro, but who cares about Apollos? Who cares about Cephas? I love him, but who cares about Cephas? Who cares about me? Paul, I, you know, at the end of the day, my goal is to help your faith be in the gospel of Jesus. And so that's why I came to you in fear and trembling and stuttering and 
Can you imagine Paul? We read stories about Paul. We see him being all bold and stuff like that. But if you read the account, Acts 17, he was in Athens. And he does that whole speech in Athens at the Areopagus. It's a little bit tense. And he only wins a few people. He must have left Athens a little discouraged. And he comes to Corinth, and it's even crazier in Corinth. But God says, I have an open door for you here. Stay a year and a half and preach the word. And he stays there, but he says, he's recalling that time. He's like, I came to you with fear and trembling. I didn't have persuasive words. I was a little discouraged in my faith and my boldness. But this was done, that your faith may not rest on me, but on God's power. You know, some of us like getting in debates about church and Christianity and trying to prove our point that in the, that in the meantime, we forget the basic reality of the gospel. We get it all into doctrinal, you know, uh, you know, all the theology and all the, we like these talks and these conversations. And, and sometimes I see some of you guys on, on Facebook and you're like debating each other. And what about this verse and the Greek about that? And, and, and it's all good and great. But my question to you, well, what, why can't you just focus on the basics, fundamental of the gospel of Jesus? I'm wretched sinner who has been saved by God's grace. I'm a simple man, a simple faith. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation, for your grace, for your mercy, for your compassion. I, I think the Internet has given us the ability to engage in commentary and opinion and debate which is, I, I think it's okay at times, but, but maybe, when maybe the gospel is calling you to turn off your phone or computer and engage the lost around you and show grace to your boss or to your employee or to your neighbor, to love wholeheartedly without expecting anything in return, to serve with pure motives. I think some of us just need to get off the phone and get off our computers and just love people as Jesus has called us to love. That's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. In order to be a gospel people, Paul says here, then he gets in the last thing here, you, you've got to strive for gospel maturity. You've, if you're going to be gospel people with gospel wisdom, you've got to strive for gospel maturity. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, he says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are, among, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, the Corinthians were so influenced and excited about their wisdom and their knowledge that they continued to fail to understand the simplicity of God's wisdom, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so Paul says that, that this message, this, this gospel message is for the mature, that God's wisdom cannot be understood by even the rulers of this age even though what they say sounds wise. If the rulers of this age would have understood God's wisdom, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. And he's telling them that, in their, that their immature perspective on wisdom could easily make them like one of these rulers. And then he gets into some teaching here of the Holy Spirit. You gotta, this is some deep stuff. You can study it on your own. But 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, right after he says, uh, talks about... Um, the message of wisdom among the mature. He says, the Spirit, in verse 11, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only 
through the Spirit. What? Yes. Let's talk. Let's break this down a little bit. Basically, Paul, he's telling the church that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, reveals God's wisdom and gives insight into the gospel of Christ. And that the person without the Spirit won't understand the gospel, the the depth of the gospel and God's wisdom, because they're discerned, those truths, those insights are discerned by the Holy Spirit. Guys, this is a big idea, okay? And I'd encourage you to study this out on your own. Uh, This is a big idea. The spiritually mature will be able to rely on the Holy Spirit to discern spiritual insights and spiritual realities that are given to us from the gospel. So the world's wisdom considers God foolishness because his words are discerned through the Spirit. So if you don't have the Spirit, it's going to be challenging and difficult for you to discern the gospel of Jesus. Does that mean that those without the gospel cannot get the gospel of Christ? No, no, no. That doesn't, no. You see, someone without the gospel of Jesus, without the Spirit, can still understand the basic tenets of the, of, the, of the gospel. You didn't have the Holy Spirit until you were baptized into Christ, right? And so you had to have some sort of understanding of what you were getting into before you had that. And so, yes, I need to understand forgiveness of sins and what I've done and Jesus dying for me and and make a decision, a conscious decision. Jesus is Lord. And once I'm baptized, I receive the Holy Spirit. And now, as I have God's spirit, his spirit will lead me to mature, to grow, to gain insight, to discern spiritual realities and insights. And he's telling the church, he's like, listen, the fact that you guys are divided like this shows me that you may not be living by the Spirit because you're not mature. You're not growing. And so he brings actually the whole issue back about unity. And he, after he says this whole thing about the Spirit, he says, brothers and sisters, I can't address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? I mean, Paul just kind of gives them a rebuke. You're drifting away from the gospel. You're forming factions based on your favorite preacher. Means that you're mere infants in Christ. You're worldly. Division in the body of Christ based on your favorite leader or preacher means that you don't get it. And so for a group that prided itself in having knowledge and human wisdom, man, this is a scathing rebuke. You guys can't understand the teachings of the gospel because you're concerned about who's teaching it and leading it. Infants, immature, needing milk, not solid food. I doubt if the Holy Spirit's even in you. That's what he says right there. I can't address you as people who live by the Spirit. If you're, if you're mere infants in Christ, are you? Because, you see, here's the thing. If you've been a Christian for a long time, and you're not growing in your faith, and you're not able to navigate conflict in a mature manner, and you're not able to uh, navigate people not calling you back for fellowship time in a mature manner, and you're not able to navigate, you know, uh, I don't agree with the direction of the church, but uh, so therefore I'm going to go visit other churches. If you're not able to, like, have healthy conversations, in a mature, I wonder if you're led by the Holy Spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? If you're 20 years in the faith and you still need somebody to call you on a weekly basis to make sure that you're having your daily quiet times with God, I wonder if you're being led by the Spirit. If you need a reminder on a weekly basis about things that we do as a church in terms of giving contribution or missions work or whatever, then I I wonder, are you living by the Spirit? Because the Spirit of Christ... The Spirit of God should mature us. It should mature us to the point where I don't need somebody to hold my hand anymore. 
I should be motivated by God's word, his Holy Spirit. I love God. I believe in Jesus. He saved my life. I will give everything for him. I will give up everything for his mission. I will be concerned about his concerns. I will serve the poor because he served the poor. I'll deny myself. I will not, I will not retaliate when falsely accused because he didn't do that. I'm, gonna, I'm willing to go the extra mile for, my, for, for the person that hates me because of Jesus. Not, I'm not going to call anybody because nobody calls me back. I'm not going to go to midweek because I just don't, I'm not getting anything out of it. I'm not going to, no, a spiritually discerning person and mature person is able with the Holy Spirit to start adulting spiritually. You got me? Some of us need to start adulting spiritually. What does this all mean for us? You know, when I, when I take off my glasses, I can see I can see 1 Corinthians 3, 1 on that screen, and I can probably read it, but it's, it's, it's fuzzy. I can see kind of the first two or three, I can see the first three rows right here, but after that, all your faces become fuzzy. And actually, maybe I should start preaching like this without glasses so I don't see anybody's expression as I'm talking up here. But when I put on my glasses, right, I'm able to see a lot clearly. I think what Paul is trying to tell the church in Corinth and what he's trying to tell us today is we need to get some gospel glasses. <laughs> we need to get some gospel glasses. You go ahead and you can go ahead and use that hashtag. I don't know if anybody else uses it. Put it up there. Get it on your Instagram. Get it on your Facebook. I don't know. We need some gospel. I think, God, I think G, Paul, I think Paul is telling us, listen, Corinthians, your issue is that you're not viewing the world and your church and your community of believers. You're not viewing it through the lens and the filter of the gospel. And so Paul establishes this mindset in the beginning of the letter and then continues with issue after issue after issue in the church that we're going to cover here in the next few weeks. But these issues, he says, listen, these issues can only be viewed in a healthy way if you view them through the lens of the gospel. What does it mean for you to, this week? I want to challenge you to start viewing the world and situations through the lens of the gospel, through the filter of the gospel. Next time you're in conflict with another believer, put on some gospel glasses. Next time you're in a tension between doing what's right or taking a shortcut, Put on gospel glasses. When your worship is dependent on the quality of the music or the quality of the preaching, put on your gospel glasses. When you need to make a decision about what career path to take or what job to accept or, or whatever, filter that decision through the gospel glasses. Is there gospel wisdom in going this route? If you don't know how to answer that, maybe you're still dependent on milk and not solid food. Next time you hear some, some things from someone successful or Pinterest or Twitter or Facebook or one of these inspiring quotes that you want to base your life on, put on some gospel glasses. View it through the lens of the gospel. C.S. Lewis actually said it this way. I love this quote. I believe in Christianity. You can replace that with gospel if you want to because it's the same thing. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it. I see everything else. What is your filter? When you get in debates on Facebook, what's your filter? If you have unresolved conflict with another believer in the congregation and it's been just lingering there for years, what is your filter? I believe in Christianity. I believe in the gospel as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. I believe if we put on some gospel glasses this week, we'll, we'll make better decisions. We'll have a little bit more faith about our world and what our world really needs. We'll be more dependent on his wisdom which our world may view as foolishness, 
But his wisdom, the power of God, will be more dependent on that than on worldly wisdom. I want to encourage you, if you're here for the first time, or you've been coming here and you're still trying to figure out your faith, and you're like, man, I wonder, do I have the Holy Spirit? That's a great place to start. If you're wondering if you have the Holy Spirit or not, I want to encourage you. Sit down with your friend, with the person that brought you here today, and, and, and get into a study of God's Word, an individual one-on-one -on -one Bible study where you can sit down and look at Scripture and how does this apply. If you're wondering, do I have the Holy Spirit? Ask the question. If you're wondering what the gospel even means, ask the question. Get with somebody. If you found our church through the website or through Facebook or advertise, whatever, and you don't know anybody here, I want to encourage you. Go by our connection table afterwards. Stop by there. Meet somebody. Ask about what it means to have gospel glasses. Come back. Make a commitment to come back next week because we're going we're gonna to take this idea of gospel filter, gospel glasses, gospel wisdom, and how it plays out in different aspects of, the ch of church life and how they apply to us today, not only in church life, but even in our approach and perspective in the world. Guys, I am so excited about what we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. I hope that you can get excited, and I hope that you will read 1 Corinthians on your own and kind of discover what nuggets God is teaching us through it, through this. You know, Jesus, we're going to have communion right now. You know, Jesus, in one of his uh, interactions with, with the people, he tells this parable about a wise man and a foolish man. And he says, you know, the one, he says, listen, those of you who listen to my word and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on rock. Or in the Apostle Luke, uh, the, Apostle Luke the, the writer uh, Luke uh, writes it as, as they build a deep foundation. And so when the storms come, the trials come, and, and, and when, the, when the winds are crashing and the waves are crashing, that house stands firm. And he says, and Jesus also tells, you know, if you listen to my words, but don't put them into practice, you're like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when the winds come, the waves are crashing, and there's a shallow foundation, what happens? The house is destroyed. And so Jesus uses this idea of the foolish and the wise and the houses that stand and cannot. And I want us as we take communion to reflect on this parable, as well as what G Paul is teaching us through the book of 1 Corinthians, and heed Jesus' words. What, what are you building your house on, your life on? Is it his teaching and his gospel message, or is it your own human wisdom? Let's heed Paul's words to build our home, our lives, not on human wisdom, but on gospel wisdom where we become gospel people, and where we strive for gospel maturity. Let's pray as we take communion. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for this time to be able to worship you and think about you and praise you. And Father, thank you for the letter of 1 Corinthians and everything that we learned today. And um, Father, I pray that um, this study will provoke us to go to your word, to trust you a little bit more, to uh, maintain uh, a desire for spiritual insights and spiritual truths and understand that those can only be discerned by the Holy Spirit that is within us. Uh, for those of us who have made decisions, Jesus is Lord and been baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. I thank you so much for Jesus. As we focus on him at, at this time, as we take the bread, as we take the cup, help us to evaluate how are we building our lives? Are we building them? on the foundation of Jesus and the gospel message, or are we building them on our own human wisdom? In Jesus' name, amen.